I'm so glad you're all here this morning. This morning we are continuing with some basics and some foundational things. As we look at what God has called for us as a community, as a church, to be loving Him, to be loving one another, and to be loving others. And more important, that we can live out love. But to do so, we need to understand who we are, the destiny that God has for us, even as we come together as a people, as a community. So last week, I asked a question, and I spoke about it. What defines our life? Our life as part of the community here. Our life with a view to be three things, word-based, spirit-led, and faith-filled disciples of Jesus Christ. And this is important. We need to be people of the word because this word contains basic instructions before truly we can partake of the life eternal that God has. Somebody say amen. You know I'm pronouncing Bible, right? Basic instructions before life eternal. Amen. <laughs> and there's 7,487 provinces here. And each of them is already, yes, that's the amen. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, you are already blessed in Christ. In Christ. He didn't say you will be, you maybe you can be. You are already blessed in Christ. But you know, Paul asked a question in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And it was a rhetoric question. Rhetoric question means a question that requires no answer, a question to remind you of something. Some versions translate it as a question, say, if you be in Christ. But really in the Greek, it says, are you already not in Christ? Are you not already Abraham's seed? Are you not already an heir to the promise? You see, your destiny in Jesus Christ is already a given fact. Somebody say amen. Whether you like it or not, God has a destiny for you. And in a destiny, I want to tell you something. Last week, we talked about it. It involves a walk of faith. It involves something else besides your walk of faith. Your understanding that God will fulfill your destiny. The destiny that He has ready has for you. Even as you were being conceived in your mother's womb. Even before you were birthed out, the Bible says, God has already established, ordained, commissioned, Amen. A plan for your life. And it's important for us to understand. And I said the third thing is your destiny is not for you alone. Amen. God wants your destiny to be not only for you, but even overflowing to those around you. Your families, your neighbours, the places where you work, the people in your church that you come together with. Somebody shout Amen. But at the bottom line, your destiny involves your choice. God has decreed it. God has established it. God has done all that's needed. It's now in your hand, in your choice. Ephesians 3.20 reminds us of this. Unto him that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, even above all. All means everything that you and I can ask of Him or even imagine that He can do. But yet, Ephesians 3.20 didn't stop there. It says, according to a power that works within you. Amen. There's a power of what you believe. There's a power of what you're trusting God for. There's a power of faith, but there's a power of your choice. And this is critical and crucial for us. But we understand that even as we want to make the right choices, last week we talked about some distractions in our life that will try to what? Trip us to make us fall short of all that God has. Sin is what makes us fall short of the glory of God. Sin is what separates us from God. Sin keeps us away from the very God that wants to hold your hand, that wants to establish 
in His love for you and for me, a relationship with you. He has given you all the promises. It's a given thing. I know everybody loves Psalm 91. How many can quote Psalm 91 to me? I'm serious. You know, even for those who quote, a lot of people will start with, oh, you know, the Lord is my shield and my buckler. You know, even as the arrows will fly in the night, even pestilence may come, even a thousand fall to my right, a thousand fall to my left, it shall not come nigh me. And we say, that is assurance. But yet, why is so many Christians falling sick? Why is so many Christians falling short of the glory? Why is so many Christians caught with the economic doom and gloom. Our minister Heng Sui Kat say, second quarter down, but not full recession for this year. I don't understand that statement. A recession is a recession. <laughs> Amen? But man will always try to set hopes because in life, if you don't have a hope, it can be very sad. Right? But God promises not only His plans in Jeremiah 29, 11. He promises in His plans there is hope and there is a future. Amen. Nobody says amen to that. And that is important. But the devil has his strategy right now. He has a plan to kill, to steal, and destroy and we examine the, na- the devil's nature and character. You know, it comes at the root word, the thief comes at the root word of the act of stealing. Klepto. And the klepto is the, is the word we understand, kleptomaniac. You know, the devil is a kleptomaniac. He can't help himself. He wants to steal. And we talked about this strategy. I'm not going to go over this again. And I want to encourage you, if you're not here last week, get a chance, go into a media centre, go into YouTube, go into SoundCloud, you can hear the message again. But not just hear. Yeah, if you have got our church app, just go to the church app. Okay? And not only hear. Jesus said this seven times to the churches in the book of Revelations. To him that have ear, let him hear. He didn't stop there. To him that overcome. You see, hearing is not enough. Many people are hearing and hearing and hearing, and you know what happens? They get puffed up. They have a lot of knowledge. But yet, there's no power. Because power comes when we act upon the knowledge. Not enough to know, but we got to live it. And this is important. We understood the devil's basic strategies. But we need to understand that Jesus has also a strategy to bring us into your destiny, my destiny, our destiny together. And we must never fall short to ensure our destiny. God has done His part. He's paid the price. It's a yes and an amen in Jesus Christ already. But it's one thing for God to do it. And I made this statement and I hope you all caught it. A destiny is already given. But a destiny has to be taken. Let me repeat it again if you didn't catch it. A destiny is already given. But a destiny has to be taken. What is not taken and left on the shelf? I won't tell you. There is a man called S.A. Tan just waiting. And we got to understand that every day you live your life is an important day. Every minute you breathe, you're making choices and decisions. And I said, and I hope you catch it, there is no such thing as an unimportant day. What you do today, what you decide to do today, what you do not even do today will determine tomorrow. God knows your destiny. But your destiny is in your hands and your choices. 
Don't let the devil steal. Don't let the devil put you into a stupor. Don't let the devil bring you into... You know, there's one thing I've said. I want to say this that much. I have been in a deliverance ministry when I first got saved. And we were delivering and delivering and delivering. And we found that people didn't get set free. We cast out demons and they came back again. And Jesus, in fact, warned that sometimes they come back with seven worse ones. Why? Because if you're not careful, you do not begin to take hold of your destiny. You become deliverance reliant. I go to here to deliver, there to deliver, everywhere deliver, deliver, and you get delivered and delivered and delivered until your promises are also delivered from you. No, I'm serious. You see, you have to take responsibility for your life. You have to realize there's an accountability for your life. But God is there. He's waiting to lead, to guide you. He wants, and through His Son, Jesus Christ, He's already paid the price of obedience. But you have to walk in obedience. You have to walk in the newness of life that He has given to us. Don't go back, the Bible says, like a dog that goes back to the vomit and eat. The past is no more. The past is history, I shouted this morning. But the history can surely repeat itself in your life if you do not learn the lessons and you wonder why you get replay after replay after replay. And some people say to me, my life is cursed. My mia I say the Bible says, you were made to be blessed. God says, I will make you a blessing that you will then be a blessing. Read Genesis chapter 12 again. See that Abrahamic promise. God is trying not to say, you've got to work it out yourself. God will fulfill your destiny. Today, we want to explore some important keys, some basic keys. I begin to ask myself again and again, you know, a lot of people say they know their destiny, they know the hope, they have the future, but yet why are they so helpless and hopeless? The first thing I want to say is that we must get our focus right in life. What is the centrality of what makes our choices and our decisions? I want you to hear this. You may have heard the expression, the heart is the center of all things. So we must understand this heart, okay? The heart is not only a physical organ. The heart is not only a spiritual organ. The heart is also, I use the word, a soulish organ. Because the heart is the center of our spiritual as much as it is our physical being. Let me explain this. The heart is a physical organ. In a physical organ, it dictates life. It pumps. Blood flows to every part. Life in the blood. How many know that life is in the blood? True, the Bible says it. But death is also in the blood. Sickness, disease is also in the blood. But we must understand it's also a spiritual organ. As a spiritual organ, it represents really the centrality of our emotions, our feelings, our everything else, as opposed to the mind. Sometimes they confuse heart, mind. The mind is the head wisdom of reasoning, but it's not about our emotions. I know it is very important, and we'll talk more to understand why. But the heart is also about compassion. The heart is also about understanding. The heart is also about life-giving and it's complex it is. And the centrality of all heart issues is about our soul, our soulish being. And I'm going to talk this a bit because, and I want you to listen. Please don't in your mind close your mind and say, oh, I've heard this before. You've heard it before. Some you may have. You've gone through CVS and you've heard it before. 
that we are created tripartite. We are created three parts. How many remember that? Yes. We are created, the Bible says, first, about being. Let me have that chart here. I have a little chart that I've put up. Can I have the chart next? About the nature of man and how we are created. I know you all heard this before, but what is the relevance of all this? It is the crux of understanding to establish ourselves what is the heart issue of life. I'm not trying to give you knowledge. I want to get down to fundamental because if you do not know who you are created, who you are today, Redeem in Christ. I won't tell you this. You're going to fall short of the very destiny and very glory that God has for you. You see, God started, we see it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. God, in creation, before that, God created everything else. He just called the things which be not as they were. Right? From everything God said, let that be, let that be, let that be, it was created. But Genesis 2, 7 says, when it came to man, God gathered earth, gathered things. He fashioned. You know, you were uniquely made. We'll go to that in a minute. But God began to fashion and He breathed into nostrils. The Bible says in the Greek Septuagint, it's zoe or ruah. It's about the life of God Himself, not just the breath of God, but the very essence of the life of God. And must, let's go back to the chart again. Okay. And the body was formed by God. But yet in that body, as God formed it, it's for a purpose. It's for us to live in that physical dimension. How many know you and I need a body to live in a physical? If you don't have a body, you are what? You're just floating around somewhere. <laughs> you need a body to live in a physical. In that body, God put the five senses. We see, sight, we touch, we hear, we taste, we smell. Through these five senses, you are affecting the physical dimension and you are being affected by the physical dimension. Right? It's sad when you lose one of the faculties. It's sad when you lose and you can't hear. It's sad when you lose your eyesight and you cannot see. you sad when you lose your sense of smell or the sense of taste. You know, for some animals, when they lose their sense of smell, it's death. Yeah, because you know why? Without able to smell, they lose the appetite to eat. Do you know an animal healthy can just starve to death without the sense of smell? I was surprised. Yes. Because they're made differently for us. Their mind is not like us. We understand this. And what happens? We were given a brain. That's part of the physical organ. How many know you've got a brain? Right? It's a no-brainer to know that you have a brain. <laughs> and that was a joke. Nah. Amen. <laughs> but it's true. You have a brain. But the brain is a physical organ. You see, the brain, we say, oh, that's the centrality of the... The brain sends impulse to every part of the body, the nerves, the neurons, and everything else, and the whole body, right down from optic nerves, right to all different nerves, sensory nerves. But I'll tell you this, without the heart pumping blood, the brain dies. See, we've got to get our focus right. So God gave a brain, no doubt. And then God, what did He do? The Bible tells us. He created a spiritual being. How many know you are created not only a physical being, you are created a spiritual being? In your spiritual being, there are some basic faculties. Some will call it intuition. You know, intuition, the French call it déjà vu. Déjà vu is like you go somewhere, you say, eh, I've been here before. Or you're talking to some people, and next minute you say, I know what Eunice is going to say next. They say déjà vu means I've already seen it happen. Actually, it's in a spirit man. In a spirit man, I want you to hear this. We are not limited by time. We are not limited by space. We are not limited by matter. It is. Because in God created us to be like Him. We'll do that in a minute. How did He create us? 
Let's look at Genesis 1, 26. The Godhead was speaking. Let us make man, M-A-N, after our image and after our likeness. You know, these two words are very important in Greek, uh, in Hebrew. Image is the word Bethlehem. Bethlehem is that we are created to be a replica of God. It looked like God. Now, God got no eyes, no nose. So we are made to yet look like God, a replica, a perfect replica. But the word bet zalem is not a dead word. It's an active root nuance. That means we were created to replicate God in doing. In an image, you are created to be like God. You are created to do things as God would do. Amen. Now you understand why Jesus said, He came on earth to be a man, He said, I can do nothing except what I see the Father do. You know, because of the fall, the devil is trying to make us do things our way. Amen. I'm sure you, you remember that song that was sung by a crooner, a singer. I did it my way. I'm trying to remember, was it Dean Martin or Andy Williams, one of them anyway? Yeah, or Frank Sinatra, somebody remember it. <laughs> but it's about doing things our way. That's the danger. We were created to do it his way. And the word demuth is very important. Demuth, likeness. Likeness is about resemblance. Where do we resemble God? God is not a man. But God is breathing into us. We resemble God within us. His nature, His character. The love of God, the agape love of God was breathed into man right from the foundations of the earth. Breathe in. You're created in His likeness. The word likeness is not just a resemblance. A likeness is about an inward ability, that, the Hebrew word, inward ability, the inward character, the word nature. You have the ability, you have also the power of God within you. Remember I quoted Ephesians 3.20 just now? According to the power that works within you. Can I say Amen. Now, this is so important. That's why the psalmist has something to say. Later, we look at it. He said, wow, I'm... He said, I will praise you in Psalm 139 verse 14. For I am fearfully and awesomely made. Marvelous are their works. Listen to this. And my soul knoweth it all. My soul knows where we are. That's what we're trying to see in creation. What is this? As I said, you were fashioned with God's hands. Not like the rest of creation when God called it out. You are so precious. You mean so much to God that He actually created the first man lovingly with His hands. You will not just say, let there be light. It was light. Let there be trees, there were trees. Let there be Charlie, and there was Charlie. No. <laughs> God created the first Adam. And then man reproduces after his own kind. As Adam was created, unique, special. You must understand this. You are created unique. Reproduce in a uniqueness. Reproduce in a special way. You need to understand this. Who you are right now as Christ has redeemed us from the fall. You have become black to where man was before the fall. And this is understanding. That's why we understand. The Genesis 2, 7 talked about how man, I mentioned it, formed with the breath of life. And the key here, go back to my chart again. Go back to the chart. Not only were you given an intuition that bridges mind, everything, time, matter, you will put a conscience in your spirit. Deep down inside in your spirit, man, you know right and wrong. You are given something that animals were not given. Animals don't know right and wrong. 
they respond to impulses. You love them, they love you. You hate them, they bite you. You are created with the ability to communicate. That spiritual communication within man, the ability to communicate not only with angels, not only with God who's a spirit, but to able to communicate with other human spirits. Yeah, I'm serious, you know. You know, I can be talking to Pastor Adrian and he's smiling nice. And all of a sudden I can feel inside, he doesn't like me. <laughs> My spirit man is picking up spiritual things. No, this is only an illustration. Amen. <laughs> it's true. That's why sometimes you have, they call it intuition, you have that feeling, you have that. It's not a sixth sense. There are five senses. There's no sixth sense. That's the spiritual sense I'm talking about. But now you see, you have this spirit now living in the spiritual realm, body living in the physical realm. But you were created to live in both realms at the same time. And there is a soulish dimension. And the Bible gives us this, that this soul is what connects the spirit man to the physical man. In this soul, the Bible talks about, yes, three faculties, emotions, about your volition. Volition is about where you, you exercise your will. And you have an intellect. How many know God gave you an intellect? I'm not talking about the brain. The brain is just a physical part. The intellect is often called in the Bible as the mind. You see, if I'm to make an illustration between both, the brain is like the computer hardware. You can have a lot of memories, a lot of what, gigabytes and everything. But the mind is a software. Your brain can only operate in full capacity if it's properly powered by the right software. In the fall, this software was corrupted. And that's why today, the normal human being, they say, only operate using 8, 9, 10% of their brain capacity. Geniuses may use, what, 18%, 20%. Whatever it is, there's so much more of that brain capacity that we're not using. Do you know that we see time as what? Let's take one, time. Time to us is what? Past. Present, future. We only know the past because we live through it. We don't even know the present because every minute the present is becoming past. We don't even know the future because every minute the future is becoming present. We're in a state of transition. But you know, that's a kairos of man. We are bonded by this. But you know, what's a, uh, that's a chronos of man. But you know what's kairos? Kairos is a God that sees everything linear. His times like this, Doop. beginning, Doop. end. He's the alpha, he's there in the beginning, he's there in the end. He sees everything like this. We don't. But let me, let me share something. You can go and read this if you are intellectually inclined that way. Einstein. They say he's a genius, he used about 20% of his brain capacity. In his theory of relativity, he saw 11 dimensions of time. I'm serious. I was intrigued. I read it. Do you know that God's dimension of time is all of eternity? He doesn't see it just in one dimension, two dimension, 11 dimension. To God, it's all eternity. One day, the Bible says, can be a thousand years to God. And a thousand years, one day to God. You see, we are trying even right now to understand a God that's so vast with our limited capacity, we're trying to understand Him. Now understand why we are now all falling short of that glory. Because we are trying to understand an infinite God with a finite mind. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts, the Bible reminds us. They are much higher. We can only think at this level. God sees at His level. And we must understand, yet God made us, the first man created, to be like Him, to be able to function like Him, ben Salem, to have the capacity, capabilities like Him. So much of how we should be living even in this physical world in a way that God intended. 
I must say we are coming sadly very short of the glory. Even as myself, as my mind has been renewed, I'm seeing more and more and a lot more I still don't understand. And one thing I can only say, the more I know, the more I realise how little I know. You see, the human mind will say, the more we know, we reach a point we think we have arrived. Is that true? We study. But the moment we get a doctorate degree, hoa, doctorate already. I wear my eight-pointed hat, therefore I have arrived. Only now they begin to realise that learning is a lifelong thing. We are still learning. The moment you think you have arrived, your arrogance and your pride limits you extending into the fullness of all that God has for us. The capacity to love, the capacity to operate as God operates on this earth. Now we must understand, as I said this, the soulish man not only has the intellect, we have our emotions. Before the fall, the emotions that God gave to man was perfect. After, and in this, God gave volition. Volition is a will. A will is about making choices. I want you to understand the second thing. The nature of choice. Give me the second chart, will you? Okay. The nature of choice is something very important for us to understand. That's why I said there's no unimportant day. Every choice you make is very, very important. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 46 tells us something. Paul, after talking about how the spiritual dimension is higher than the natural, he asks the question, how be it then? How is it? That what comes first is not the spiritual, but the natural. Then comes the spiritual. Because it's the natural choices that we make will either open you the right spiritual dimension or the wrong spiritual dimension. There's a dimension of God. And God says what? You want to come to my dimension? As I am holy, be thou holy. What is holiness? I, I'm serious. Because too often we have religious ideas of holiness. Our idea of holiness is about the posture of our body, how we pray, how we do, do things. The idea of holiness is our life being regulated by rules and regulations. Partially true. But the holiness is about what God says, I am separated from the world itself. You want to be holy? You're called to be in this world. You're called to be still impacting the world. You're called to be still taking dominion and multiplying in the world. But yet, you're not to do it the world's way. As God would do it, you need to do it. The devil wants to bring you here. He wants to keep you in your body. In your body, what happens? It's the last of the eyes. The last of the flesh. The pride of life. You know, is it okay to have loose moral relationships before you're married? That's fornication. The Bible says a fornicator will not inherit the kingdom. It surely opens the doorway for the devil to come to kill, to steal, destroy. Understand this. God does, is not a joy killer. God gave the things of the flesh for us to enjoy. Is did not God give sex, for example. But yet, all these things can be abused. And we are just want to satisfy the last of the eyes, the last of the flesh and the very pride of life. You see, what separates of God is when we think we know what we're doing. We have our own plans, we have our own desires, we have our own agendas. Where do they come from? Through an intellect that's today fallen. 
and not able to see things as God does. But still, God gave the choice. Because why? God gave man the freedom of choice. God not only gave you the ability to choose, and that's important, but God gave us the right to choose. Do you know something about angels? Angels have been created, the Bible tells us, with the ability to choose, but they have no right to choose. Because they have no right to choose, they make a choice, they're out of God's estate. There's no redemption for him. He's only waiting for the final outcome because God left him there as an alternative. What's the alternative? If you've got freedom of choice, God must leave alternatives. You, you, if not, you go to God and say, God, you gave me choice, but the whole world is one colour, white. Or you say, God, you gave me choice, but there's only you, God. There's no choice. So because God gave you the total freedom of choice, God will leave an alternative. If He doesn't, He's not righteous. He doesn't want you to choose the alternative. But yet He cannot bind you. If He does, that's what the church is trying to do. We're trying to put religious boundaries, religious ideas, and we're trying to teach people, you've got to sin less. I've talked about this. If you know who you are in Christ, you're no longer a sinner. Are you still sinning? Yes. Should we condemn the sinner? No. We condemn the sin, but we got to walk with the sinner. Why? Because God sees hope and a future. God sees us being translated from darkness into His kingdom. In His kingdom, we still make choices. In His kingdom, the devil still tries to kill, to steal and destroy. But you have the choice. I see so many, sadly, people making choices moved by the flesh, moved by what the eyes see, what the flesh tells them, what the heart tells them. The heart of the matter is, what is God telling you? You see, God says, be holy. Yeah, I'm holy. I come to church every Sunday. But look at your relationships. Are people going on holidays with people of various sexes and having a party at the same time? Oh, no, 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 I don't go into orgies. Anything you do which brings you in the world's way separates you from God. Holiness is the word to be separated for God. If you've got anger, you're going against the very fruit that God wants you to have. Remember Galatians 5? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness. I like that one. Long suffering. When you in a community, there's a lot of long suffering. No, I'm serious. You see, every of this fruit tells us to be separate from God. How will it be separate from? Self-control. Hello? <laughs> Never mind, now one time, next time. I won't tell you this. You start doing something wrong the first time, second time becomes easier, third time, fourth time, it becomes second nature back to you. But it's not about being religious. It's not about trying to sin less. It's about trying to now understand the obedience that Christ has shown to us. And Paul always says, now walk in obedience, walk in that newness of life. You see, your choice is very important. God's plan from the beginning was life for man, and we have the balance. In that relationship with God, even though we have the alternatives, he said, here's a tree of knowledge, here's a tree of life. What's a tree of knowledge? Was it something that's taboo? God put a tree there to tempt men. No. I believe at one point of time, God would have allowed men to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But you notice, what was the fault was not about eating out of the tree, but eating it in disobedience. 
God said, eat everything. Except the tree, because if you do, you shall surely die. What's that death that God's talking about? What is that tree of life? I mean, why after the fall, God says, now man cannot eat the tree of life, otherwise he be like God and he will live forever. Actually, it's not that God never intended man to live forever. Before the fall, the life of man was not limited. It's only after the fall in Genesis 6, verse 3, that God limited the life of man yeah, to 120 years. Psalm 90, 10 say, even then you're not able to accomplish it. 3 score and 10, 70. Well, I already passed it. I'm middle age only. Amen. No, I'm serious because he says, actually, because you're not even able to attain that 120 years God has given. 3 score and 10, 70 years, maybe 80 years. But I want to tell you something. He that runs obedient to God, what happened? Moses, before Christ came, not only lived the full 120 years, his eyes were not dimmed, nor were his strength, a life force, a bit. Amen. I don't know about you. I'm only in middle age. Nobody say amen to that. Please. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's a state of your mind. If you think you're old, you are old, man. <laughs> amen. I don't count the white hairs. I count the black hairs. <laughs> amen. <laughs> I think we've got to get our perspective right in life, right? If we start to count the wrong things, you don't count your blessings. You want to walk in the blessing of God, then learn to count your blessing and come into His cause with praise and with thanksgiving. Amen. I want to tell you this. Everything was perfect in harmony before the fall. Let, let's take a look at Nick's chart to tell us something. Result or wrong choice? Very quickly. You see, who was meant to be the God of the world? Look at somebody and say, you are, I am, we are. I'm serious. At the fall, all of a sudden, the evil one says, now I'm the God of the world. Hey, he's still saying it today. Turn to Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. He still declares himself as God of the world. Second Corinthians, sorry, verse 4, 3 and 4. But you know, what happened? Death reigned. There was spiritual death, where we could no longer discern spiritual things. There was physical death. The Bible says, and death came. Sickness, disease, aging, Stress. And who will become God of the world? Satan. How do you know? You know that song? Money, money, money. It's a rich man's world. That's the spirit of mammon. I have lived 21 years now. Money has not been my God. I've learned to live in the abundance, the provision and providence of God. I want to tell you this, God is still able to do exceedingly abundantly. In our church, we have to trust God every day for God's provision, for the rental, for everything. I don't trust the world. I don't trust the devil to provide. I don't trust men even to provide. If I trust you to provide, I'll be looking at strategies how to get the money out of your pocket. I trust God. You know how God provides? He works inside out, changes your heart, that you learn to give. And the promise it says, I'll make you a blessing, that you will be a blessing. As you are a blessing, I have learned one thing. You can never outgive God. Amen. Amen. And this is important. So in this now, the devil's plans come in. I, I use this, the yin yang. You know, the yin yang is about trying to balance the positive and the negative, trying to balance. I want to tell you something. God wants you to be a positive person. He doesn't want you to try and balance. He doesn't want you to balance between my anger and trying outside not to look angry, go home angry. And 
How many know that? We got outside face, home face, alone face. Wow, we got different masks. Sometimes forget we've got wrong masks up in the wrong place. No, God is not just looking about you changing masks. He's looking after the fall. He paid the price for a transformation that you can become transformed back to who God created you to be. Amen? Not devil's slain, trying to balance good and evil. There's only good and there's evil. Your choice. You choose. And I tell you, God has a plan that even when creation fell, there was a curse. Yes? You say, wow, God's so bad, put curses. I used to think like that until the Lord showed me. I didn't just put curses. I made a way for the curses to be broken. God put the curses because otherwise, as a righteous God, He had to judge. He had to judge sin at that point of time. But yet, He postponed that judgment by sending His Messiah first. Somebody say, Amen. Everything came under the curse. Satan, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 12 say, Satan came under the curse. Creation came under the curse. Genesis chapter 3, 7 to 18. Woman also come under a curse. I'm not going to teach on curses. Genesis 3, 16. Look at it. You know that many women are falling sick exactly because the curse is still operating, that you have not understood the curse has been broken. Do you know one of the curses is on what? Two things. Problem in conceiving, problem in birth, birthing out. Do you know many women are having that? They're having a lot of sickness in all the parts which is meant to be for fruitfulness and multiplication. Yeah, we're getting a lot of cancer in those parts now. But it's not understand this. That even men, Genesis 3.19. Now you know why so many working and they no day, no night. Because you're working under a curse. You only eat out of sweat of your brow. Amen. When I realized, I thank God the curse was broken. Amen. But we still have to learn to walk. So the God's plan for redemption, I want you to hear this, is not change. We'll talk about more practical things next week. But here I want you to understand that redemption has been offered through obedience. Romans 5.19 tells us that sin came to the world because of one man's disobedience. Now because Christ is obedient, many be made righteous. You know that word be in the Greek word is very interesting. It's about can be, will be? No. It's about shall be. It's not about not what Christ has done. It's about us being able to appropriate. That's why you don't hear me using the word claim this, claim that, claim that. It has already been given, so we have learned how to appropriate what is ours. You know, when you claim, it's like, it's not yours, I'm claiming something. But No, I've learned to be in a relationship with God the Father. I only learn to appropriate what the Father has already given to me and not allow the thief to kill, to steal and destroy. Amen? And this is important. How will we get it? Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 tells us. Let me read that. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. If it's your own Bible, please underline the word confess, underline the word Lord. And shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Equation. For with your heart men believe it unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Believe what? That Christ has been raised from the dead. That's all you need to believe. Confess what? That Jesus is Lord. Lordship equation involves a few things. Surrender of our own plans, our own agendas, and our own desires. Next one. You know what you're predestined to be? Write that word down, Romans 8, 29. All of you have a destiny, first destiny, to be predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Commitment to that is very important today. And it requires an action from you, an action to walk in the obedience of Jesus. As he forgives. As he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
What are you doing? Walk in the newness of life. Go and read the whole chapter of Romans chapter 6 and understand what it means to be walking in the newness of life. And not only God can break the bondage of sin from our life, God can take the power of sin from our lives. Somebody say amen. I don't want to go and teach that enough. And there's a total salvation that God wants to give to you and I. Okay? Total! That you and I can be that man of and woman of destiny. That we can rise up to be in a place of significance. Many of us are not in a place of significance. We are still in the wilderness where it's just enough. God doesn't want you to be in the land of just enough. God wants you to be in a promised land overflowing with His goodness. But we need to understand there's a process of salvation. And this is something that the church doesn't really talk much about. I want to just talk very quickly before I end this. And next week we're talking about the practical steps to take. But enough to understand this. The moment you accept Jesus, and I make sure you understood this, not just saying, I accept Jesus, having died for me, but commit to a lordship equation. Remember I just spoke about it? By the act of the will, you believe. You confess that, lordship. You already wash. The price has already been paid. There's no more debt owed to Satan. If you are owing a debt to Satan, the wages of sin is death. There's no more debt because remission is talking about the debt has been discharged. Don't go under the debt anymore. Understand, you are born again. Genesis chapter 3, verse 3. Nicodemus came. How do we born again? When you accept Jesus, you are born again. The Bible says to see. It means spiritually you are alive already. You are born again spiritually. Your spirit man is born again. Your spirit man is alive again. Your spirit man is able now to bring your body to walk. But you see, the spirit man still needs to go to the soul. I didn't understand this. Many people are still struggling. But how many know the soul needs to get saved? It's not my words, it's in the words of the Bible. James 1.21 Lay apart all filthiness and all superfluity of naughtiness. I'm quoting King James. And with meekness receive the engrafted word of God which is able to save your souls. Yes. You see, you've got to make a choice. To lay apart all the filthiness, to lay apart all the naughtiness, to go and go back. If you confess Jesus, Lord, Lordship requires you, remember, obedience, walking in the newness of life. You can't do both. I'm sorry. I see in many countries, Christians, and divorce rate among Christians just as high as non-Christians. Fornication among Christians just as high as it among non-Christians. I mean, wake up, church. What are we to be? We are not to be the same as the world anymore. This is what God is calling us out of. So you got to make a choice to lay apart all this. You know, there's a naughtiness in our spirit. You just want to go back and do naughty things. I'm serious. Take selfie until... You push boundaries to see how far you can go before you. That's the part in your unredeemed soul. <laughs> That's what Paul says. That naughtiness and that superfluity of, as, that filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness is an overflowing naughtiness. You know fire burn, yet you're going to... Mm, mm. Hey, when I was young, we know firecrackers can hurt, right? We challenge, take five, hold five, pang! Have you all done that? Red paper, pang! Then, breathe, go for white powder, pang! Oh, you, my skin splits, start crying. You see, we know it hurts, yet we push boundary until we get hurt. This is the problem. But you got to act of the will, you got to lay apart. Now, what begins to work of redemption? The word says engrafted. You know what's engrafting? 
You see, there's a process, and next week we'll talk about this process, how the Word of God gets engrafted. It's not enough to be hearing. You've got to be learning to read the Word daily. You've got to learn to study the Word. You've got to learn to begin to internalize the Word. You've got to get, meditate the Word. Then you can become a doer of the Word. Amen. And this is important. Then what happens? When your mind gets renewed by an engrafted Word, your heart will change. Now, realize, he didn't say, what? Renew the heart. The Bible is talking about change your heart, but your mind got to be renewed first. As your mind is renewed, then heart automatically gets changed. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. As your mouth so speaks, then you will so act. It's true. If you keep confessing all the wrong things, then you wonder why you get all the wrong things. There's a power of confession. We'll talk about that next week. Then what happens? When your soul gets saved, your emotions, your heart will change. Your intellect will see differently. Your choice will change. And then your body can be brought to subjection. And I just close with this in Romans chapter 12. What did Paul say? He's talking to believers. Huh? Brethren, I beseech you. I beg of you, he's saying. Beg. You've got to present your bodies now as a living sacrifice. He's not asking you to present your dead bodies, your dead works. In fact, one of the doctrines is repentance of dead works. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And a living sacrifice must be holy and acceptable unto the Lord. God has forgiven. You have to make the choice to walk. And this is important. All this can, however, be happened. In 3 John, he talks about something. Jesus talked about you're born again, spirit alive. Spirit man's alive. But your soulish man still needs to get saved. How does do that? That's why the Holy Spirit was given. John 3, 3. Life spiritually, John 3, 5. Marvel not, said Nicodemus, that you need to be born again of the Spirit, not just to see the kingdom of God, not just spiritual life to see the Spirit, but to enter into the kingdom. God has made for us, we partakers of the 7,487 promises of the kingdom. Unfortunately, many are not even partaking. I won't tell you whatever you need right now, whether it's finances, whether it's restoration, whether it's reconciliation, whether it's healing, whatever you need right now, not only eternity, but right here. Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and will be forever. Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and will be forever. So I want to tell you this. But you have to learn to be a doer of the word. James 1.22. Not just a hearer. Hearers of the word will deceive themselves. You need to do something for the Holy Spirit to begin to engraft, to begin to renew your mind. For the words that come out of your mouth that will change. Because your words to speak establishes either the authority of God or allows the devil to come to kill, to steal, destroy. You have the authority. And I quoted just now 91. Everybody loves to 91. But they forget the activating verse of Psalm 91, verse 1 and 2. How many can quote that? Those that dwell in the secret place of the Most High, they shall then abide in the shadow of mighty. <clears throat> and then they're able to declare, the Lord is my refuge and my fortress. In Him will I trust. Amen. Right now, 
I want to close this service, and I hope I've laid some positive foundations for you to understand maybe why you're still struggling, why you're not the man or the woman of destiny that God wants you to be, why you're not in a place of authority and power, why you're not in a place of significance and to be that person influenced from God, but you're being influenced by everything around you. Yes, next week we'll share some positive steps you have to take. But right now, I want to give a call. A call for those who want to just not acknowledge the finished work of Jesus, but to say today, Lord, I want to confess you as Lord. Today I want to acknowledge God that you have done it all already at the cross. But today, I want Lordship in my life. I want to make that commitment today that I want to take the step of faith into holiness. I want to take the step, step of faith to humble myself. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people were called by name, will first humble themselves. And pray. Not just pray. Seek my face, the Lord says. Yet not just seek His face. Turn from your wicked ways. It's not business as usual. It's time to stop all the negative confession. It's time to begin to look at yourself as the white man and woman of destiny. To rise up from all your reasons, excuses. To make a choice to walk in obedience, to walk in a victory, to walk in the glory of what God has paid up for you. To stop all the negative confession. If God is speaking to, to, to you today, today, right now, and you want to say, the Lord, I'm not recommitting myself, I'm making a commitment that from this minute henceforth, I'm going to start walking in the newness of life. I may still feel my flesh is still here, but I will not give up. If that's your desire right now, we want to pray with you. We want you to take the act of faith, the act of faith to even say, I want to get out of my seat, I want to walk right here. I'm going to walk here and when I do that, I'm saying yes to Jesus. And I'm saying no to the devil. No more am I going to walk in the old ways. Today, I realize what Christ has done. And today, I'm not going to rely on any ministry or anything else. But I'm going to rely on you, Lord. If that's your desire, even as our musicians and the worship team will begin even to worship God, I want you to take the act of faith and say, God, here I am today. I want to come and step into that river of life that you've given for me. I want to come and, Lord, be that man and a woman of destiny for you, Lord. I don't want the devil to steal from me anymore. My life is not going to be up and down anymore. There's only one way it's going to go. I'm going to go from glory to glory. If that's your desire this morning, come. The altar is open right now. Come and do business with God. Come and say, Lord, here I am. Hallelujah.